thing. All right. So uh, I'm just going to put that right there. Okay. All set up. Okay. Well, did, tell me about, you know, uh, sort of uh, bring me to, from quickly from from birth up to service, and then let's talk about the okay, service. I've got here. Okay. Okay, date of birth, October 1st, 1926, means I'm 80 plus years of age. Yeah. Uh, place of birth? You'll be 81 in October. 81 in October. Uh, place of birth, farmhouse, one mile from Wallace, Austin County, Texas, within three miles, the banks of the Brez River. It's all a Brez River, a Brez Valley boy. Right. My parents were Colonel Herman Henry Spody. He's a son of German immigrants to the U.S. They met here in the States and got married. I see. I mean, he didn't come up with them. Then my mother was a descendant of a frontier family, and they, her grandfather took got bought a lot of land out in Austin, Fort Bend County. Uh-huh. And uh, and her father was an Aggie class of 1881. So I'm trying to give you things that might interest you. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Uh, and he and his son and his son's son were the first Let's three. Be, so your grandfather was class of 81. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. And his first three generations, mm -hmm. him, his son, and his son's son were the first three generations to go to A&M. Right. Um, uh, my uh, brothers, uh, Herman Henry Spode, Texas Aggie class of 45. He was a Marine Corps fighter pilot who was lost on a flight from Hendersonville, Guadalcanal, 1st of July, 1943. Mm -hmm. I got his picture here. That's, That's his brother? Yeah, when he was in the Marine. And my brother, Stuart Lee Spode, Texas class of 44, Aggie class, was in the Navy during the war. And he died uh, about four years ago. I see. Uh, personal family, I was married February the 8th, 54, to Nancy Ellis Groves, who was an assistant professor of home economics at Lamar State College of Technology, now Lamar State. Yeah. She was uh, she was hired there in that position when she was 21. I, I met her and married her when she was just turned 24. I mean, we have three children there that you've got their names. Right. Like it. And military experience. Okay. Uh, junior ROTC in high school, Thomas Jefferson High School, San Antonio. Okay. I grew up in San Antonio. Yeah. yeah. It was an outer, it was on the outer limits of San Antonio at that time. It was not right. an inner city school. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Have you ever been to Jefferson? Uh huh. Beautiful school. Yeah. Beautiful school. Yeah, I went to some summer classes. There. I loved it. I summer. loved it. Uh -huh. College of ROTC at A&M. 1944 You're was right. my first year. It's summer, mm -hmm. summer and fall. Mm -hmm. We had three uh, semesters each year to try to get people through college. Right. Uh, it was generally tough, but not on me. My room and I were room at least for our battery commander. And the uh, sophomores, we'll call them flightly sophomores. Uh -huh. You know their names, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Did not mess with us much. The physical education classes were tough, however. I like to describe any of you in the war as three quarters an educational institution and one quarter uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. We had optional courses, how to survive, when, not if your ship was sunk, and so forth. Right. And I entered the Marine, United States Marine Corps Reserve. I wanted to enlist first since I finished high school. My mother, having lost one son, said, uh, Robert, would you please get one semester of college in before you go? So I came and enrolled in A and M on D Day, uh -huh. 1944. Uh -huh. Uh, then I enlisted. They, they followed through. They let me enlist after one semester. Right. But then they told me to come back. They thought they had somebody waiting in San Antonio, such a patriotic city that uh, they thought I'd get another semester of college before they needed to call me up. Uh -huh. So I came back and re-enrolled. And so I got this the fall semester, and it was called active duty in January of uh, 45. You see it here. January 22nd, 1945, second page, boot camp, Paris Island. So that's why I went to spring 1945, first time I came in first on a run about half a mile. I was in good shape after being in a <laughs> mile and seven times. Right. Um, and Dr. Penberthy uh, really worked us out and, uh, and run the mile. And uh -huh. My hardest assignment and boot adjustment was the encounter with men from other sections of the nation. Some were pretty slimy people, I uh -huh. thought. Now here at a &M, we were all pretty much of the same socioeconomic right. class. Second phase training came to June, and then they plucked me out of the replacement Steve stream and sent me to Japanese language school in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, summer or fall 1945. Then the combat intelligence school, I got to be a school boy again in the Marines. Uh -huh. And then Robert Range Coaches School in Quantico, Virginia. And then finally they organized this first special Marine Brigade for some reason and sent us some maneuvers down to Puerto Rico. And then I was just joined the Marines as a private first class, August the 13th, 1946. Um, then uh, 
1946, I re-enrolled in A&M uh -huh. and uh, took, started immediately in junior ROTC. I was a sophomore academically, a junior in ROTC, and with senior privileges. I see. Because all of my colleagues classmates were seniors yeah. and an Aggie never lost his class, you know, right. never loses his class. Exactly. And so yeah. uh, uh, while I was here, I was sports reporter for the battalion in the spring of 48, covered the first baseball team that has more uh, members in that first team of any first entering class in the Aggie Sports Hall of Fame than any other class, had four of them, mm -hmm. Guy Wallace, Pat Hubert, uh, Wally Moon, and John DeWitt. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I covered the Fresh football team the next fall. They were a pretty good team. Gail, Larry, Glenn, uh, Glenn Littman, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of them. Uh, and both of those teams, Marty Corot was the coach. Right. Uh, and in 1949, became sports co-sports editor of the battalion and covered the varsity track team with, uh, and uh, there, uh, and there, uh, Colonel Andy was the right. coach. And yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, in the summer of 1948, I was commissioned a second lieutenant army of the United States because I had not graduated from college. Mm -hmm. They only gave me a reserve commission. I see. You got a picture over there of me being sworn in by my father over in Germany, mm -hmm. summer of 48, right in one of these pictures here, somewhere there. There he is, the Florida. Yeah. Uh, then in 49, when I graduated, I was commissioned as a distinguished military graduate, second lieutenant of the United States Army, regular army. In that fall, I went to the officer's basic course, Fort Riley, Kansas where all the new second lieutenants of the Army were West Point and DMGs, all reported 700 of us. Mm -hmm. That was kind of good for me because I found out I could compete academically with these brilliant West Point guys. Right. And I, I competed very. And spring of 50, infantry officer basic course Fort Benning, Georgia. And that kind of an interesting story because when we applied, uh, we knew we were going overseas. Right. And basically our choices were, seemed like Japan, uh, Puerto Rico, or Germany. The talk was, one well, basic course in spring of 1950, uh, well, if you go to Japan, you never go out in the field. Uh, you live in an apartment, they have four understrength divisions, and not combat ready, and uh, if you're married, your wife will have three or four maids, Japanese maids paid for. And living is good for married couples. You stay with your wife. And most of the people who are married were very recently married. They almost don't have honeymoon yet. Mm -hmm. and, but if you go to Germany, uh, you spend six months a year in the field. The first division is the only division over there. And everybody knows that Russians are going to invade Germany just any moment now. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Germany, you, you get to really be a soldier. And if you get leave, you can go to the Riviera, Paris, do all those really interesting places over there. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Japan, what you, if you've seen Mount Ju uh, Fuji, Yaki, what are you gonna, Fuji Yama, what are you mm -hmm. going to see do next, you know? Right. So uh, as a bachelor, you know. So, yeah. so generally, all the bachelors ask for Germany, and all the married officers ask for uh, <laughs> Japan. Uh -huh. We finished. Fourth bending on the 16th of June, and on the 25th of June, the North Koreans came south. Mm -hmm. Those people who had asked for Japan never stopped in Japan. Right. They joined uh, their outfits. Some of the very perilous, I mean, very mm -hmm. real. They never had time to bond with their platoons. They were all platoon leaders. Mm -hmm. And the class of 50 and the class of 49 at Westport had the highest casualty rate within the first years of any West Point class, mm -hmm. because in World War II they were selected, made of AIDS and stuff like that, right. kind of protected them. They had a lot of investment in them. Right. They weren't cannon fodder, but in, over, in, over in Korea they were cannon fodder. So yeah. I had a lot of friends lost uh -huh. over there. But I went to Germany. Yeah. Spent three years playing soldier in Germany. Uh huh. Uh, so it was, you know, one time I had an assignment to go out in front because we had no identification and I spoke to identify if any tanks came down the Autobahn, I was supposed to be able to tell them whether they were Russian or American tanks, you know, in a radio, but I was way out in front of our lines, you know, to give them an early alert. But uh, but three years over there, the war, the shooting ended. It started on when I was on my pre-overseas leave and it ended on my post-overseas leave. Mm -hmm. So a total bracket of the Korean War there. From 50 uh, to 53. 50 to 53, right. Summer to summer. 
summer to cycle. Which was about, when did the Korean War end? The Korean War ended in July 1953. Yeah. I know the guy who negotiated the ceasefire, where he was a Christian uh, lieutenant general. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, but uh, then uh, I came back and I went to Officer General Basic Course at Fort Riley before I went over there. That was that. And then, then the Infantry Basic Course. And uh, then I went to, over there. While I was in Germany, I was assigned to 16th Infantry Regiment, the 1st Division, the Big Red One. 16th had a lot of esprit. He was called, the Reisenauer called it his Praetorian Guard. And of course, as a lieutenant, you had many additional duties. I know you like sports, and mm -hmm. so I got to, I was the A&R officer and as such, I got to coach a, uh, I'll be in charge of the basketball team. I see. And we won the night, that's I, it stands for I company, I was an I company. Uh-huh. Thank God it's farm. And we won the, uh, the uh, regimental championship 20 team, best of 20 teams. The guy that won it for us was this guy right here. He in the you place here? college ball, the little guy here, the little guy. He was his name is Howard. I know, but is this you? Yeah, that's right. right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was, was a very good nice experience. Uh, uh, Did your wife do the scrapbooking for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is wonderful. She My wife does scrapbooking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Then um, I came back from there and went to ROTC instructor at Arlington State College. Arlington State. Now the University of Texas at Arlington was a junior college part of the AM system at that time. Uh huh. And I married February the 8th, 1954. Uh, as I said before, my wife was a uh, assistant professor of home economics, mm -hmm. clothing and textiles at uh, Lamar. So you all been married 53 years? 53 years, coming 8th of February. Right. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> then after two years at uh, Arlington, I went to the Advanced Infantry Officers Course at Fort Bing. And then I went back to uh, Korea. I went to Korea as you come to command of the 21st Infantry Gimlet Regiment. And came back from there, I became adjutant of School Brigade, Fort Benning, Georgia, for a year, and then became instructor for two years at Weapons Department, the Infantry School. <coughs> Company commander, uh, staff officer, 24th Infantry Division, Augsburg, Germany. Uh, and then staff officer support command, I came back from there, went to Fort Hood. A staff officer support command, in the 2nd Armored Division, I was the S1 of the uh, support command. Then I became executive officer of the 1st Battalion, 41st Mechanized Infantry Battalion, 2nd mm -hmm. Armored Division. Then I became a military advisor, went to uh, Vietnam as a military advisor in Kantum in the Central Highlands uh, there. Uh, and we had participated in the uh, operations at Doc To, Duco, Plamy, Ardrang Valley. Now I've got a picture of Norman Schwarzkopf. Mm -hmm. When he was the uh, senior advisor for, it's in the book, uh, We Were Young Ones and Soldiers. Mm -hmm. Shows Norman Schwarzkopf walking along and says he was the uh, senior advisor for the Vietnamese Airborne Task Force. Mm -hmm. Well, they were under our operation control, and I was the G3 advisor. I had to have met him. But he was just another major, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. I was a major, he was a major. Right. So I don't remember him. We're not buddy buddy, don't yeah. misunderstand. <laughs> but it says that he was, you know, at Duco at this uh, right. thing. Uh, that is a, uh, that's where I got the ex uh, the combat infantry badge and all that stuff. Uh -huh. Of course, we were out there. Um, uh, so I got the uh, Army Accommodation Ravine with Cluster and the Republic of Vietnam Cross of Gallantry. The, the Vietnamese before the communists. <laughs> gave me a medal, and of course I got the combat infantry badge for service. The expert infantry badge, it's, it ranks below, and if you have the combat infantry badge, you don't worry it, the expert infantry badge, but it was a lot harder to get than me. All I had to do was stay alive to get the combat infantry badge. I mean, you'd be there, you know, mm -hmm. but the expert, you had to do things, you know, it was, it was tough. Right. Uh, I'm very, I'm very proud of getting that brush because I was 35 years old when I got it, when I was over in Germany. Sure. Educational ladder, pre-college education, Simon to Texas uh, Elementary School, that's in uh, uh, Fort Bend County, uh -huh. and then Central Ward Elementary, Lufkin. Why did we move so much? Because uh, my father was on uh, CCC duty. Right. He was a camp commander, and then a uh, sub-district commander, and then a, a district executive officer. And North Waco Elementary School and Junior High School, then Marshall, Texas, and Waco, and the left across the street from the DeWitt boys. John was one of them, and David his brother, and uh, Bill his brother, mm -hmm. who played together. Marshall, Texas, the best buddy there was a fellow by the name of Y.A. Tittle, 
Uh, he come, he's my same age. Then Fort Worth, Texas, McLean Junior High and Pasco High. There I hung around guys who won the state championship in Pasco. I thought I was a club foot because I was all around these world-class athletes and I wasn't in any comparison to them. You know, they were there. Um, then San Antonio Thomas Jefferson High School, and there was a Charlie Parker and some other people there at yeah. uh, that time. Then first visit to A&M, Aggie Davis. It was 1936 when my father brought me to the TCU Aggie football game. The TCU quarterback was Sam Ball, and yeah, sweet ball, and the Aggie running back was sophomore Dick Todd of Kroll. Mm -hmm. I don't do, those are maybe predate you, you mean nothing. No, I, I heard both of those, obviously. Obviously, Sam um, Ball and Dick Todd also. My second visit in 1938 to visit my newly enrolled brother Herman in the corner ramp of Perrier Hall. I enrolled in A&M on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944. Now this is when you, these first two visits, you drove down from Lufkin, right? Dr Lufkin then up from Waco. Yeah, right. Okay. We moved from Lufkin yeah. to Waco. Right, okay. And then uh, we enrolled in A&M in September 1946 following the Marine Corps service. Um, graduated uh, in 19, uh, June 3rd, 1949. Uh, Co-curricular name, sports writer, and co-sports editor of Italian. Uh, Aggie student newspaper published five times each week, even at that time. Uh -huh. uh, and we worked at it. Uh, we, at the sports page, we had a real animosity or antipathy toward taking anything off the AP wire. We wrote features right. about the athletes. Uh, we did a lot of uh, writing, and we thought we were really goofing off, but we just took something and slapped it into the paper, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, which I, and they also assigned, um, as you saw before, a reporter to each of the teams, like the fish team right. and the varsity teams. Each had a reporter. We fought for space for our teams. We were very, very jealous for our teams. Yeah. Then education uh, diploma, Thomas Jefferson High School, Bachelor of Arts in History at A&M, Master of Arts in History, Hardin Simmons University. Thesis and, and Doctor of Philosophy in History from the College of William Mary in Virginia. College teaching, in addition to the ROTC and assistantships and doctoral program, assistant professor of American Institution, Mackinac College, Mackinac Island, Michigan. So you went off east to, to Hardin Simmons and then to William and Mary. Yeah, I went to Hardin Simmons and Abilene. Well, in, in that, Abilene, that was yeah. in, I was stationed in the Army, I was teaching ROTC. Okay. And I got, oh, yeah. And I got yeah, my. Cross referencing here, yeah, that's right. And I got my uh, master's concurrently with teaching there. It was a perfect place. Uh, and then what took you to William and Mary? Just uh, they gave me money. They, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and uh, I thought the Lord would want me there. I, yeah. It's, uh, you ask, uh, I saw, I just saw a announcement about them uh, having a doctoral program. Kind of intrigued me. And I applied for eight universities from Texas Tech, Texas University, Oklahoma, Louisiana State, uh, Michigan State. Uh, North Carolina, University of Virginia, uh, and William and & Mary, and I was accepted at all of them, but I got offered for money from two, Texas Tech and Hardin Simmons, I mean, and uh, William and & Mary, mm -hmm. and I had gone down and given, I'd given my testimony to Christian Businessmen Committee luncheon, and it went really good, and stopped to have coffee with my wife on the way home, and while we were talking about the things of Christ, the phone rang, and a fellow in the bar said, this is John Silvey, I want to offer you an assistantship yeah. at William & Mary, which will pay all of your tuition and give you a stipend in addition. And uh, then I thought, well, if I go to Texas Tech, I thought that would please my parents, and give the grandkids home close by. Right. And, but I'd have to do it in Texas history there, that was their strength. Uh -huh. But if I go to William and Mary, I can go to any area, go to American colonial history, and that can be used throughout the world. I would be more usable if I went to William and Mary. So we went to William and Mary. Right. And uh, when I defended my dissertation, I told, they asked me why I went to William and Mary. I said that. And John Silver said, first time ever been called the voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> College teaching. Uh, in addition to ROTC, right. uh, Mackinac College, uh, Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee, which is a tiny, tiny interdenominational, uh, uh, non-denominational uh, Christian college, uh, very conservative uh, uh, theologically and That's so a beautiful here. place, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, we live right on the hill. I live Did you? about 150 yards from my office. Is that the only right? traffic jam I had was with the squirrels between yeah. me and my office. I almost took my wife on vacation there one summer, no. but uh, I was too, I was too late to, I mean, I was 
this was in like February or March, I started thinking about the summer and I was Pacific. thinking I couldn't get any place. They were, Pacific, where we they were all full. Oh, I, I, I forgot where, uh, what was that movie that they filmed there? Wasn't it that, that um, Oh, the Inher Inherit the Wind? No, uh, it, was, it was more recent than that. It was the one with uh, uh, Christopher Reeve and uh, all the girl that played uh, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Uh, they were oh, that was, was Mackinac. That was Mackinac. Somewhere in time. Yeah, somewhere in time. Oh, yeah, Mackinac. Well, yes. that's podium there. Right. That college they had there. Right. I leaned on that podium. That's where I talked. Right. Okay. Right yeah, it's yeah. called Somewhere in Time. Somewhere it's in a Time. Really yeah. nice movie. Right? Yeah, it's really, really nice, nice movie. movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Except they show cars there. There are no cars on the island except yeah. for uh, yeah. a fire engine and an ambulance. Uh huh. But uh, you know, and, but bicycles. Horses right. and and carriages yeah. you know, where you get around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even school buses are, are sleighs and carriages. Right. It was, about a year there. it was it was great. It was a year's vacation. Oh yeah, yeah. I know. Because the college was there trying to get it started. And then mm -hmm. uh, I returned to the Promised Land, Aggie Land, in 1991. Activities. Uh, a Bible teacher at Los Prados. That's my invention. Los Prados is there. Goes mm -hmm. the river over here. Most people don't know the full name, The Arms of God, mm -hmm. uh, weekly Bible study. Uh, I have written uh, right, two books, Two books. one of them right here, mm -hmm. uh, Double Identity of Texan Hitler's Life. And that's what I want to uh, make sure that gets on TV. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, that's yeah. one of the reasons I wanted to be on your program is right. to present the book. It's right. about an Aggie. Right. It's interesting. and. Um, what I'll do is I'll take the cover and I'll, I'll, I'll scan the cover. I've got to like a photograph. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to yeah. give you this. Right. This. I mean, it's not a bad. What I'm saying is with this, it's been extremely well received. Okay. I cannot be more pleased. When was it published? It was. This was published a year ago. Mm -hmm. Just about. Was it a year ago? Oh, last last fall. Mm -hmm. Got some people on there you might want to like General uh, uh, Miller. Uh huh. He's a three-star general. Right. I, I want. He still lives. He lives here, right? Yeah. Yeah. He okay. was my Bible study. I need to get him on the show. Right. I've had a lot of people talk about General Miller. I yeah. have. So. He's, he's he's very easy to talk to. Right. And then I'm working on a biography. And all, we all knew a little Greek about a five foot four inch uh, man. It's in progress. It's in progress. Almost almost finished. And then I've been chair of the board of directors of Brazos Valley Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Mm -hmm. Covered 14 counties, I'm sure you know about that. Oh, yeah. Then president of Adult Chapter Brazos County Fellowship of Christian Athletes after a uh, four year term, three something, what they have there. And then three year term on that, and I made them get somebody else because it's the national constitution says you serve three years and you're out. Right. So, okay, so we're going to follow the constitution. I'm a strict constructionist. Right. Co class agent, Texas A class 48 from 1992 to the present. And assistant director, uh, board of directors, Texas A, Soul Ross Group 2005 to the present. And attendance at all volleyball, all soccer matches, all football games, all baseball games. <laughs> all baseball games. Yeah. What? You're a great supporter. Uh, and let's see what's on this last page. Not much. Uh, membership mag, quarterback, six man dugout, maroon clubs. Chair of Republican uh, Party of Brazos County Resolutions Committee for several cycles, not no longer, and a delegate to Texas State Republican Party Convention. Uh, membership in National Office Fellowship Christian Life, Officers Christian Fellowship, through which I became a Christian, and Retired Officers Association. What a life. Take me back to uh, one thing that caught my eye. What was going on in, in uh, Korea from 56 to 57? What? What did you do there? Well, I was a company commander, a company commander of regimental headquarters company of the 21st uh, Infantry Regiment, uh, which I mean, I had uh, 400 people for whom I was responsible, but I did not work for them. They didn't work for me, but I was responsible for their care and cleaning. Right. Uh, and uh, we went right up on the DMZ, on, on the Imjin River. And then I was transferred to command L Company, which is a better assignment because it was, mm -hmm. uh, I had command then. I was not just a wet nurse to a bunch right. of people. Uh, and uh, there, when I walked out of my hooch, I looked across the valley, and there's Clark Career over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next hill's over. Right. There's a valley there, the Imjin River. We ran up on the Imjin River. Right. On what they, we call the gooseneck of the Imjin River. Right. Other people called it other things. And um, I've got some pictures of that too, me. 
and the cold and snow. And it was about the most miserable uh, place that you can imagine. Hot, humid in the summer, bitterly cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. It was a miserable place. Uh, uh, Take me through your year in Vietnam. What? Uh, okay, my year in Vietnam. I, yeah, your military advisor, but you. Okay, saw quite a bit of combat. Yeah. Well, yeah. What the outfits we were. I was G3 advisor for the 24th Special Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, I flew into uh, Saigon, and the things that impressed me. I looked down, and I saw the little. Go ahead. I saw the little uh, triangular uh, things there, forts, and I thought those are for real. Those are not practice. Those are not demonstration. There's a real fort team they're using. Then I went to bed at night at the Brinks Hotel, and I heard cannon fire. And I said, oh, there's no safety officer on those. They're trying to kill people. And I'm trying not to kill people. You know, in the Army, I always had to be that safety officers. And uh, there's no safety officers on those cannon. They're shooting for, for real, you know. And so then uh, I had some friends there, from, uh, Christian friends, stationed there. and. Uh, this, this was, I guess, your first real first exposure first. to combat. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. I've been in Germany. Yeah, yeah. It was You've been in Germany. Yeah, during, I've been in Germany. And I've been, been in Korea in, after the war. Yeah, it could have happened you know, anywhere, but it right. did not happen. You know, and I've never seen the first dead man I saw was when we were coming back from Germany. He was on the roadside. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd been killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first dead man I ever saw. Was yeah. Pretty safe to be around. Right. And uh, But when I went to uh, Saigon, this Lieutenant Dick Trudenick says, when you get your assignment, come by and see me now. I'll show you the situation, ma'am. And I went by and said, I'm being assigned to Contum, which is... Not true. That coup. Mm -hmm. Contum is right there. Contum. Mm -hmm. And he, when I told him that, he said, I'll pray for you. In took my situation map, and that place was just surrounded with by red, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was a very dangerous place uh, there. And uh, so we, uh, I went there as chief three advisor. And almost but as soon as we got there, we had no teamwork. We had a, it was a new organization. They pulled some of the guys that flew in with me and sent them off to bend me to it, which is down here. Um, Chio Rio, they says on this man, mm -hmm. and to run some kind of operation, and they got chased up and down a ditch by mortar fire from the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, we heard on the radio, but we, I wasn't there. I won't blow it up any. And then one of the hairiest things that happened was Doc To right here. The Viet Cong attacked that place. Yes, they, uh, they come down through uh, <clears throat> Cambodia. All they were always trying to come in through Cambodia. And Doc told us this is a valley. And uh, they attacked it and killed the uh, Arvin Regimental Commander. He was killed. And we flew up there uh, to advise them, give them help. And uh, it was a cloudy day. And the, um, the pilot said, well, we're going to go in low because if we're going high, they hear us coming and they can shoot at us with the machine guns. We'll try to get by them before they know we're coming. Mm -hmm. If there was a clear day, they would have flown real high and come in, you know, which would have been safe. But uh, I did not know, but he was flying so low, it was like a roller coaster, and the skids of the helicopter were hitting the treetops. Mm -hmm. And I was doing okay until the co-pilot of the helicopter, he would turn around his face just as white as it could be. I mean, he was scared too because of the pilot thing. He could cut the those things. Uh, a couple of days later, the pilot was uh, rotated with psychological problems. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so uh, that was kind of, that was kind of a hair thing, but there was blood uh, spotted. Then after that, next operation was at Duco. It's right there. Right. Special forces came, uh, and they were being besieged by the Viet Cong, and uh, we. Uh, I had ran an operation to go out there along this road here uh -huh. with the uh, Vietnamese Airborne Task Force, Norman Schwarz, Major Norman Schwarzkopf, advisor, uh, to go out there. We went out there and joined them halfway out there. And I was talking to a young lieutenant by an Army personnel carrier. 
And everybody said, oh, can't be any bead con around here. There's too much fruit on the trees. They haven't stripped the trees or anything else, you know, so, for food or anything, so. So we got back in our merry little helicopter, flew back to play coup. We walked in headquarters, and as soon as I walked in, we were receiving small arms fire. That lieutenant was killed within a half an hour of the time I was talking to him about. Uh, seven, a 57 recall round hit that APC and exploded and killed him. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a big fight there. A big, big fight. Uh, going down there. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, it was. And then after the fight was over, which we essentially won, called in all kinds of air, which I had to part of doing. Uh, the, uh, and then it was all over and we started pushing in, uh, or the task force started pushing in towards uh, Duco Special Forces Camp. And uh, this kind of ridiculous thing, which makes most people who were there so angry they could bite nails. The people somewhere in Washington, I believe, wanted a body count. Mm -hmm. What's a body count? And we'd say, we don't have the foggiest idea. They're out in the jungle, dead. We called in planes, we called in artillery. Uh, give us a body count. Give us a body count. We can't give you a body count at any accuracy. We want a body count. Okay, well, we talked to some Vietnamese and they said they had dug uh, 40 ditches, uh, 40 graves, and the Viet Cong had buried four, five to a grave, or 50 graves and buried four to a grave. And uh, so there's 200. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, a gunship said he put some rounds into a building. He saw about 40 people running into the building. The building was totally destroyed. Well, there's 40 more. So 240 is a body count. I mean, we were, I mean, yeah. no, no right. Uh, but they, you know, we, we tried to refuse. They would not accept a refusal. Right. So we gave them. So all reports from, from Vietnam were just like, like that, you mm -hmm. know. They start yeah. talking about body counts. Right. Uh, you notice now that the Army, you know, their young officers then are saying, no body counts. Right. We don't right. want any body count kind of Right. Because uh, you can't know. Just to know how can you ever count bodies? You're not going to go out in the jungle and, and endanger yourself. No, because then you become one of them. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, yeah. and uh, later on, when I went to uh, Germany in 1948, I smelled, I thought, boy, these European cities sure stink. They really smelled, and what I, you know, found out later, they was decaying human flesh under the rubble in '48, mm -hmm. and I smelled it again because of decaying human flesh out in the jungle. Mm -hmm. you know, almost all it smelled like urine. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you go into underpass where people have urinated, mm -hmm. except kind of odor. You know, just horrible, mm -hmm. horrible. And I smelled it anyway. The airborne got into the special cars camp, and then they wanted to. Uh, evacuate their bodies and wounded and want to resupply of food and ammunition, which is fine. But the bad thing was the Colonel Cody, the uh, battalion commander over helicopter battalion, uh, refused to fly out bodies. He said, they're dead. I'm mm -hmm. going to fly them. I'm going to take my pilots by flying them out. And uh, so he agreed. Finally, everybody said, OK. They fly in and evacuate the wounded, and they drop pigs in and, and parachutes, <laughs> and for them to butcher and, and, and kill for food stuff and ammunition could come in by parachute. Right. And uh, but when the helicopter did land, the first thing that the Vietnamese were putting on were dead bodies, and the helicopter crews were throwing them out one side of the body, but the uh, Vietnamese were putting them in on the other, and they kept yelling for the wounded. You know, but they were they prefer. A, in that culture, apparently, a good burial is more important than staying alive. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, did that. Um, and then we uh, went out, we flew out to Duco. And as I remember it very well, it was a beautiful evening day, and, and absolutely beautiful. And we were going to land there, supposedly under small arms fire. And really, really strange. I didn't worry at all. I thought I was going, you know, into a very. Um, dangerous uh, place situation, and I saw the silhouettes against the 
sunset, you know, it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is strange how you think of these things, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely gorgeous. We flew in there and we landed and uh, we had an airstrike around, which frankly I'm very happy for it, uh, Tom, because, you know, you can get excitable. Uh, you, you wonder how you're going to react when uh, the river meets the road, you know. And I was just as calm and cold calling an airstrike right around the uh, special forces camp, you know, real close, you know, mm -hmm. and got him. And uh, I really was, oh, I'm almost thankful for the experience, uh, knowing, you know, myself, getting you know, myself. Right. And uh, so we were there, and uh, the head of state and the head of government of Vietnam came out there and they kind of displayed for them. And I have pictures somewhere of them. I think my, my son's got, I have another uh, a notebook, a scrapbook of uh, my time in Vietnam. But I gave it to my son. He's up in Dallas, a lawyer in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but uh, all the weapons that have been captured and all this, that, and the other thing. But it was a. Other uh, than hitting the treetops that day, I mean, what? There were some other instances I saw. Oh, another in bit in, in Contum. In Contum, yeah. one day we got a word. Good intelligence source at 5,000. Oh, well, let's put, I'll put a few back of this to the this is come to, and our, our compound was over here, and the army compound was over here, the army compound. We were advisors to these people. We had our own special little contact, and don't tell anybody, but I never ate as good as I did when I was there. <laughs> Every Sunday afternoon, you could go and pick out as many steaks you want to and charcoal bar them yourself. Uh -huh. We had uh, salad bars, the salads you'd never dream of, you know, fruit, tropical fruit. But anyway, there was a, a road went up this way, and a road went across this way. And right here, on Catty Corner, just corner to corner with ours, was a uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators compound. Mm -hmm. I still had friends from there. And, uh, but it was corner to corner. I never had great admiration for them. But then there was another road going across this way, went up into there. And uh, this road came across here. And uh, we got word that these uh, 5,000 were coming this way, you know, mm -hmm. supposedly with good intelligence, supposedly about as good as being in Iraq, you know, mm -hmm. weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. You can't always depend on intelligence. And we were, got into a very reinforced concrete bunker here in our compound, and we were communicating. And I was the G3 advisor, senior advisor, Colonel, full Colonel, who said, Well, Bob, I guess we ought to be with our counterparts, the people we're advising. Don't you think? Do you want to go over with me? And I honestly, I listened to literally the words, sir, you used the wrong word. Do I want to go with you? No. Will I go with you? Yes. <laughs> and so we got a Jeep. And how far was it? Oh, mile and a half, two miles. But we thought we thought all of this would be in Baku by the Kong in between us. Mm -hmm. And we headed out and down this way and this way. And when we headed out, one jeep, driver, full colonel, major, I thought, sure, I was going to, oh, there was 60, 40, I was going to be dead in the next uh, next 30, 40 minutes. What were you? What, right? I was a major. A major. But uh, nothing happened. Uh, we, we came over, we went up here, we called in, popped the magic dragon, you know what that is? Uh, it's a shy, side shooting. Uh, transport plane. Yeah. Okay. Transport right. plane. They started off with uh, DC three. Right. Right. I, I and then, interviewed people who flew those. Yeah. And then, then they had uh, the one. Then they had one thirty. Right. Yeah. Six forty seven. The later on, one thirties. Right. And they have three Gatling gun cannons. Right. That spray out eighteen thousand rounds a minute. Side of the, the yeah. plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eighteen thousand rounds a minute. Mm -hmm. Same second, right. uh, 6,000 rounds a right. second. Right. I had a fellow on the show that flew one of those. Yeah. And, and, and you just pray. Right. It, it, it could ruin their whole day. Yeah, sure. And uh, so we called that in and sprayed this whole area up in here uh -huh. with them. And um, nothing ever happened. Now, the <clears throat> people we'd like to get under our operation control were the Vietnamese Marines. Their commander should have been the army of Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. The people of Khantoum shuddered when they heard that the 
Vietnamese Marines were coming in because they were robbers, rapers, but they were fighters. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we liked to have them in control because they would fight. Of all the Vietnamese we had, they would fight. And uh, they, uh, the most. And we liked to have them, you know, but the civilian population really dreaded them coming into the area because right. they were. They were bad actors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was another experience I had, you know. But uh, will you? Do you want to go? No, I don't want to go. I will go. <laughs> I don't want to go. But it was a strange thing. We'd drive out. I mean, it was a weird war. Eight to five war. A slipping thing under four blankets. Uh, the weather there was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, cool enough at night to sleep under. Four blankets. You could play tennis or go swimming. We didn't have a pool, but it was warm enough to go swimming. Mm -hmm. When we drove out of the compound that night, there were a bunch of people there with an agricultural uh, advisory service there, playing tennis under lit under under uh, lit tennis court. You know, I said, "What kind of war is this? I'm going out there. I think I'm going to get killed. Those guys over there playing tennis. You know, what? <laughs> you know, I just it didn't compute. It really did not compute." Right. And as I said, we had wonderful food there, and uh, so uh, it was there. Then when we added uh, Duco, uh, I flew out there. Then uh, at Play Me, uh, they also had Play Me, which is in here. Where is Duco? Just, we had Duco, but it was not good enough for it. Here's not good, Doc Toes. Uh, Duco, play me. Uh -huh. Those are mountain yard words. Duco and play me. Uh -huh. This is where the mountain yards live. The mountain people. Mountain yard is a French for mountain people. Uh -huh. And they are not. They don't look like the typical Vietnamese. They used to look like American Indians. Uh -huh. Short, stocky, powerful. The Vietnamese are slim, slight, slender, graceful. These people are are not. And the Vietnamese. Don't, they treat them about like we treat American Indians. Uh -huh. They were the indigenous people there before the people came in. And uh, Play Me was under uh, uh, besiege, being under siege. And we were we moved, came down to Play Coup again, set up there, and we're getting in airstrikes around Play Me. And one of the things that occurred there was uh, on one of the. Air Force people were shot down in a parachute down in the jungle, but he had his little radio and he was in communication. They were trying to rescue him through an air liaison officer in a light plane, like, like a L-19. And um, uh, all the time, uh, they, they dropped, you know, uh, they were, were spraying around him trying to keep the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese come up on him. The outlet of the Yo Chi Ho Chi Minh Trail was uh, right coming right through this area here, mm -hmm. where these the three nations cross. Mm -hmm. there, uh, are down here further, down here, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. South Vietnam. No. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, we, heard, I heard this on the radio. I wouldn't participate, but this big airplane, command ship, over twenty-five thousand feet. We kept breaking into the net of this liaison officer saying, give a situation report, give a situation report. How are you doing? And they get him out, give a situation report. Finally, I heard the air liaison officer say, listen, if you don't get, you're interfering with our rescue of our buddy more than the Viet Cong. And if you don't get that expletive deleted, expletive deleted out of here, I'm going to send one of these jets up there and shoot you down. Mm -hmm. What they were doing, they wanted the information and send it right back to Washington. Instant uh, communication to Washington. And Washington did not need to know until we got the guy out. Right. And uh, they, uh, until I did not, we, I said we until uh, they got him out. And uh, they shot up then. And they got him out safely. You know, mm -hmm. They dropped a line down and pulled him out of the helicopter. And rescued him. Uh, that was one. The uh, then Duco. Now, have you seen the movie with the young ones? Seen it several times. Several times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, seen it several times, and I've, and I've read the book. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. That is it's, occurs. It's, it's the best. Oh, I I think. Can you get it, honey? Uh, it's the best. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best Vietnam movie I think ever made by far. Right. Okay. Yeah. Here's Van Gang Pass run through here. Mm -hmm. That movie begins with the uh, ambush of, right. of the uh, mobile task force of the French Army. Exactly. It's on that. It's right on that thing, road right there. Right. Uh, I Drang is right down in here. Uh huh. Right down here. Well, we were, uh, they were, during the battle there, now, we had a mission, and those, some of those pictures there, those, uh, with the machine guns and helicopter, we had the mission of keeping this road open for resupply with using regional force elements. Regional force are like the National Guard, except a step below the National Guard. I mean, they were not untrained. Uh, and uh, we were using them, so the full colonel and I and uh, were staying out here. Some of the pictures there show our living conditions there. Uh -huh. And uh, we were out there on that on that highway, and we would helicopter helicopter would come out. We'd pick up some regional force people and drop them in various places just to see if we could find any big con around there. Uh -huh. But it was a uh, um, a very uh, Hazardous thing, I would say that that they could have scarped us up any time they wanted to. Sure. Uh, they didn't. Uh, the uh, only stupid thing I ever did when I was over there, a lot of people wanted air medals, and so they would volunteer to fly in the L-19s, the observation small observation planes, to get flight time. Mm -hmm. I considered my wife and three little kitties back in the United States. And I said I don't need air medals. They need a husband and a father more than I need air medals. So I didn't do it. But I did one day, I wanted to be the advisor for the Vietnamese Marine Task Force. Was a name a fellow named Bill Leftwich from Memphis, uh, Tennessee. And uh, I thought so much of him that he was leaving. And I got in the Jeep by myself and drove across Mangang Pass to say goodbye to him. Mm -hmm. That was a stupid thing to do, Tom, but I wanted to say goodbye to him. He was later killed when he went back. He was the uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce National Man of the Year right after that, two, a couple of years after that. And uh, But he went back over there as battalion commander, and he was trying to rescue somebody, and he dropped one of the lines down from his helicopter. He got caught in the bush, and his uh, helicopter all were down on the ground and killed him. How long of a drive was this, this stupid drive? This, drive, this stupid drive was uh, 30 miles, 20 miles, something like that. 20 Did miles about. Everything go okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Nobody had nothing happen. <laughs> I'm here. Everything happens. I mean, I, I, I live under a, you know, a wing, but uh, so that all happened. And then when this, after this few cooperation, that's when I got the cross of gallantry and uh, got the, uh, for the whole thing. And then, then I moved over to... Well, tell me about the, the Cross of Gallantry. What, what happened and what did you get there? I don't know. I just did my job. No, I just did my job. I don't. I like to think I was gallant. I, like, I want to yeah, idealize Galahad. I'm not being gallant. But um, I, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know, you know. I just did my job and I got the, the, the uh, Bronze Star for Meritorious Service. Mm -hmm. I just did my job, you know. Really, I mean, it's just nothing. Uh, I had never had a chance to win it for valor or anything else. Were you Thank a lot? Oh, not a lot, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm driving in from Phuket uh, to a place I heard some go crack over my head, you know, one time. But and, uh, no. What do you carry? Do you carry a rifle or a pistol? Or? I carry a pistol and uh, a carbine, maybe. Yeah. Mostly a pistol. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, we sit out in the jungle sometimes. Weird things. I mean, this is a weird war. Yeah, it's a weird war. Not you know, can't think. Not like World War II. Uh, and uh, one time, I remember sitting out in the jungle between Duco and Pleiku with a guy that had gone to Cal Berkeley, and he was a um, libertarian, a devotee of Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. And we sat out there and discussed philosophy mm -hmm. for about three hours. You know, in the not, he was he was my driver or something worked on me. And uh, it was uh, uh, I, I mean I can't imagine sitting down in the jungle 
talking about philosophy, you know, yeah. where you could get shot any time. Yeah. It's just a, yeah. Nobody ever shot at me, though. It's <laughs> a lived a charmed life in that sense. And I'm not, don't misunderstand me. But uh, then uh, after six months there, they had this policy of six months in one assignment and then six months somewhere else, which was a horrible policy. They moved, um, uh, they transferred me over here to a regional force training camp at Phuket, just north of Quinyan. Mm -hmm. I see Phuket. Yeah, Phuket, yeah, yeah, Phuket right there. Uh -huh. And uh, I was there for a uh, light six months of my tour. And the funniest thing that happened there, uh, oh, the well, saddest thing that happened there was I had a friend we met in Fort Bliss when I was teaching RTC. He and his wife, and they had six children. And he was the S-5 advisor for this district. And he took a convoy of foodstuffs up here to some refugees in this area, right in this area here. Mm -hmm. And on the way back, they were ambushed by Viet Cong coming down here. And I heard all this on the radio. And uh, you couldn't get to them, you know, they were 10 miles away or so. Uh, and they threw a grenade and his jeep were not turned over and he was laying on the ground and some of the others were laying on the ground, they weren't hurt. Mm -hmm. And they played absolutely dead, they didn't make a sound. But he was unconscious, he moaned. And the Viet Cong walked up to him and put a rifle to his head and shot him dead. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Rick Schmidt, Ricky Schmidt, his widow was uh, Marty Schmidt, Marty and the six pack, six kids they had. Uh, and I heard it all, and I've got somewhere I've got a picture of his Jeep that was there. Uh, and that was a, a pretty tough, because we, we had shared a table with him out at Port Bliss and met them. Uh -huh. and, uh, but then uh, the funny thing, you know, I mean, there's always a humor in this thing. Mm -hmm. Went down to Quignon on a, a scarfing, scrounging mission one time. See what I could pick up with a jeep. Just drove down with a jeep to for our uh, cadre at this training camp. And uh, went to this one place, quartermaster, and said, do you want some ice cream, some stateside ice cream? Man, do I want some stateside ice cream? Yes, where, how many, you know, well, how much do you want? I thought they'd talk about a bowl. How much you want? What do you mean, how much you want? How much you want a bowl? I said, well, we've got a, a uh, reefer out there, a freezer barge, out of the harbor, loaded with ice cream. But we've got a ship coming in, freezer ship coming in, loaded with steak. And we've got to get rid of the ice cream so that we, that we'd rather have the steak than the ice cream. Mm -hmm. So we need to go dump the ice cream out in the harbor or give it away. How much do you want? How much I want? We were an hour away in the tropical heat uh -huh. uh, from where we lived. But we had a, uh, a helicopter gunship outfit living with us. Uh -huh. So I got on the radio and I called out and I said, you guys, I said, ask them if they like ice cream. <laughs> said, ice cream. They said, yeah. I said, well, send them, have them send in some helicopters here. And we'll load it up with stateside ice cream. So we, they sent in three helicopters, and we loaded it to the gunnels with stateside ice cream and flew back and uh, put it in freezers at our camp. And uh, the uh, General Hal Moore, who came here to Annie, might have get to talk to him. When he'd go down uh, Vietnamese Highway Number One, we'd get forgotten on to be as the ice cream stop, because uh -huh. he'd always stop to have stateside ice cream <laughs> there. Because we had, we were loaded with stateside with uh, right. stateside ice cream. Now that's the funny side, you know. Yeah. The bad sad side is Ricky Schmidt and uh, people like that. But it was a and thing, you know. I when I went over there, it was emergency requisition. Cutting them in half at Fort Hood. And they said, you've got two months to report to, to the Port of Embarkation for shipment uh -huh. to uh, Vietnam. Yeah. No matter training, which most people, military advisor training, no language training. Go over there and advise somebody you can't even talk to. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. And so I mean, it was very, very frustrating in that sense. Did you know how more? I knew of him. He was okay. a general. I was a major. Right. So I don't know whether you had met him or not. No. I mean, yeah. maybe I don't. But right. uh, he, uh, but, uh, unlike 
the word for hello. Vietnamese is a tonal language. Uh -huh. And the word for hello with a different tone says harlot. <clears throat> so I would never try to speak, say hello mm -hmm. to a woman. Right. <laughs> in Vietnam, you know. They'd be saying whore, you know. Yeah. That's that's a a fine line. A fine line between my, uh, <laughs> the uh, commanders, the colonels, uh, Vietnamese colonel's wife and yeah. that. So, uh, the most frightened I was in Vietnam uh -huh. was when I was standing in line to fly back. My wife and our three children were going to meet me at Travis Air Force Base, right. along with my nephew. Right. And we were going to drive back and camp across the Sea Grand Canyon and all this stuff across the United States. Right. You know, Yosemite and so. And uh, a rumor started. They have a bunch of emergency leave people. They're going to knock off the bottom, the last 25% of this line, uh -huh. and postpone their departure. Right. And I could picture my wife standing at Travis Air Force Base, watching the plane come in, and I'm not on it, you know. And no way to communicate to me, no way for me to communicate to her. Right. And I was frightened. I was really frightened. Right. Hi, how are you? Small so right. 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 I know all about you now. Oh, there. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not all. You don't know all about it. You don't know that I can't find my car keys. Uh-oh. 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 I've looked in all my purses. <laughs> They're not where I usually keep them. Well, <laughs> mine are over there. Okay, mine are over there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, that was, but it was rejoiced. I didn't make the plane. Well, Bob, I hate to tell you, but they're not here. Well, they're somewhere. Uh, want me to get to tell, tell me where to look. Go ahead. Go look at the trousers hanging in my closet. Okay. Uh, or on my desk, on my dresser. The, uh, I'm sorry. To, no, that's fine. Go but, uh, well, I was sad. You know, the other thing when I was over there, my got her wife, uh, really looked for the mail. I mean, helicopters. I identify helicopters now with the mail coming in. Uh -huh. And getting letters from my wife. And, and one day I got a letter from my daughter who's been in the first grade. And she wrote to me and said, Daddy, do you remember what I look like? I don't remember what you look like. Would you send me a picture so I'll know what you look like? I didn't, you know, had not been over there very long. Uh -huh. And, um, so, but then when I came in, and she, they were standing behind a glass door, and I was going through customs and all that stuff, and they, they couldn't come in. But this little girl was standing there, just pressing, just caressing the glass door like this, you know. Uh -huh. and she wanted, and she saw me, you know, just really caress the door. So, very, very sweet. Uh, uh -huh. Very fond memory. But uh, it was a, a good, good moment. Why is it a great scrap, huh? Yeah, my wife, I'm very proud of her. Can I borrow this to, 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 to uh, scan some pictures? Yeah, but don't take them out. No, 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 no. I can scan them right yeah. where they are. Yeah, to 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 he said scan. he cannot take those pictures no, no, out. I would not. No, they can't. They're glued <laughs> on. You want any of those like the... Yeah, I'm going to look at those here in just a second. But this is... Uh, no, I would not believe you guys. I, I really have respect for her. Um, What's his name? Um, little short, bow-legged guy. He was uh, landed with the Airborne in uh, D-Day. He was on your show, and I saw him. For, for, I had no idea. Oh, uh, he had yeah, that record. Uh, I know his name. Uh, yeah, the one that also uh, he jumped in. Yeah, he jumped in. Oh, uh, yeah. Look in the car. Okay. Uh, Do you find the keys? No. Mine? No. Go ahead, take care of that. Okay, just Lewis Hudson. Hudson. Yeah. What? I look in the car. I don't think they're there, honey. No. No, I got to be that's where the golf is. Oh, let me see. I think probably this would be the easiest way of doing it. <laughs> Frank left a hundred pound of sky crane.
Oh, one of the things that happened over there, uh, we had Robert Mitchum come and stay with us about five days in Phuket. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And uh, the public image of him was very accurate. He was kind of fuzzy all the time he was there. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> he was a nice guy. Really right. A nice guy down to earth. Really hung around with the enlisted men a lot. And, uh, but one time he said, uh, uh, what's the source of your commission? Sticks in him. You know, he said, "Oh, and you already done I'm the movie. In a movie. You've done the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've never been this, late. This right. is, yeah. Right. This is a, <laughs> the, the typical. I mean, to float out of all float outs, unintentional. Uh -huh. uh, I was a senior major, and I said, "You were in. We've never been licked because it's the only movie by then." Right. Uh huh. He said, "Yeah." I said, I said "Man." I saw that when I was in junior high school. I didn't. I saw it when I was a senior in high school, but uh -huh. I, I remembered it way back. Right. He looked at me like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that mean he was really old. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. He was in that movie. <laughs>